Welcome to the Graveyard of the Atlantic. Located in the outer banks of North Carolina, these treacherous waters are home to over 3,000 shipwrecks and have claimed numerous lives due to the strong winds and severe weather conditions. But for the team of elite Coast Guard pilots, flight mechanics, and rescue swimmers, they're the ones that are called upon to respond in the most extreme and deadly situations. Today, I'll be taking on the ultimate challenge, stranded out in the middle of the ocean to experience getting rescued by the United States Coast Guard. Helicopter 6004, ops normal, position 3545, decimal 9073. Three, two, one. I'm Lieutenant James Gardner. I'm a helicopter pilot at Coast Guard Air Station Elizabeth City. Our goal here is to provide aviation support for the Coast Guard's varying missions. We fly with a crew of four, two pilots, a flight mechanic, and rescue swimmer, and we have crews here on base 24 7 ready to respond for distress. Being located near what's known as the Graveyard of the Atlantic, we respond to a variety of different types of cases. Some of those could be rescuing someone from a boat that's sinking, a long-range medical evacuation, and even hurricane response. Every year, our unit responds to about 300 search and rescue cases. Today, we're excited to have Sam come out and see how we train and simulate these rescues. So this is quite the beast of a helicopter, and to my understanding, it's both the largest and most equipped helicopter the Coast Guard flies? That's correct. This is the Sikorsky's MH60, the version you're looking at today is the T-Model, which has a full glass cockpit display. It's the most capable helicopter we have in regards to on-scene endurance and uh, cargo carrying capacity. It's configured specifically for search and rescue missions, law enforcement, and aids to navigation for our mariners out there. Now, I heard you guys sometimes conduct search and rescue operations as far out as Bermuda, which is like 600, 700 miles away from where we are in Elizabeth City. How is this helicopter able to do that? One thing that's different with this 60 compared to others is that it's configured to carry 6,000 pounds of fuel. We have three external fuel tanks. You can see we have an 80 gallon external fuel tank on the right hand side and two 120s on the left. That can extend our fuel endurance up to five hours. So is that not scary flying hundreds of miles out into the ocean in just a helicopter? It can be, but I gotta say the C-130 crews are our most valuable asset that we have going out there with us. We can ask them to fly different altitudes to test our tailwind, which will maximize our range. They're also on scene first, which can minimize our on scene time and minimize our fuel burn ultimately. So how does the MH-60 handle the extreme weather conditions that I'm sure are thrown at you guys when you're conducting your search and rescue? I gotta say one of the most valuable things that we have to allow us the confidence to fly in those conditions is a great maintenance program. Our flight mechanics are not only conducting the rescues in the back, they're turning wrenches 24 seven to make sure that we're able to operate near the limits. Uh, for us, we also have in the front a digital automatic flight control computer, which will help augment the pilot controls to maintain a stable hover. Now from up here, you really can't see what's going on underneath you. So I imagine you're relying on your crew in the back to give you instructions. What's that process like? Our flight mechanics are our eyes and ears. They do an incredible job conning us into precise confined areas. As you'll see today, we have a specific flow and cadence that we follow so that we can uh, effect a rescue. So what is the worst weather and lowest altitude you guys can safely operate in? So I gotta say the most critical phase of flight that we operate in is when we don't have visual with the water above 300 feet. So essentially based off of the clouds and the visibility, we're flying through them. And to get down, we can program what's called a manual approach to a coupled hover. This is also known as a match. This will give the pilot lateral and vertical guidance down to the surface of the water so that we can effect a rescue BMC. Now, as Lieutenant Gardner mentioned, the typical search and rescue mission includes four total crew members. Your two pilots up front, the rescue swimmer, and the flight mechanic, who's qualified as part of the flight crew to help manage the hoist system that's used to recover survivors from the water. This position is one of the most vital because the flight mechanic is the one communicating with both the pilots and the rescue swimmer to ensure everything is operating smoothly and safely. So your job must be incredibly hectic, having to keep your head on a swivel in what I imagine is a very stressful situation. What's the secret to doing it successfully? Yeah, you're right. Stress is inevitable. It's part of the job. But the same tools that we use to manage that stress are also what make us so successful. Our constant training, our teamwork, and extreme trust in one another. Now I'm super excited to get rescued here in a little bit. A little nervous for sure. <laughs> um, but I know you're going to be in charge of pretty much my safety. So can you walk gotcha. me through what that uh, evolution looks like? Sure. So in aviation, everything starts and ends with a checklist. So we'll talk about what hoist we want to conduct, what gear we're going to use, and where we're going to position ourselves. From there, the motion gets going. 
we put ourselves into the right position, get the gear ready to go out the door, and we'll lower the gear and the swimmer into that hoisting area to the survivors. From there, swimmer does his magic, gets everybody ready to come back up, signals that he's good to go, bring them up, rinse and repeat until everyone's in the helicopter. Now the final piece of the rescue crew is of course the rescue swimmer. Now I could do an entire video on the intense physical training and bravery of all those who make it through rescue swimmer qualification, because it's pretty amazing. The 24 week training program has one of the highest attrition rates of any military training pipeline, with around 80% of candidates washing out. In other words, these individuals are the best of the best. Hey, welcome, Sam, to Air Station Elizabeth City, and this is the Rescue Swimmer Shop. Thank you. I mean, I think everyone knows how incredible you guys are, but I'm not sure everyone's aware of how intense the training is to actually even be qualified to be a rescue swimmer. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. So it is very intense. Um, it is a six-month-long training course where we're working out Monday through Friday, starting early in the morning, land workouts, moving on to the pool, a quick lunch break, and then more pool workouts in the afternoon. And we're trained for desperate situations where people need help and we're trained to uh, handle anything that's given to us on any given day, so. Now, something I've always wondered is, do you have to come from a swimming background? Like, are most of you rescue swimmers like competitive high school or college swimmers, or can you pretty much just come into it with no experience and just kind of will yourself through it? Yeah, so uh, that's a funny question because uh, you would think that a lot of us come from competitive swimming, but uh, for me, it's, for instance, I don't. So I learned through YouTube. <laughs> really? So, yeah. Yeah, um, I would say about half of us were competitive swimmers, and then half of us just taught ourselves. So you don't necessarily have to be a competitive swimmer. Now, what's that feeling like when you jump out of the helicopter, you have the opportunity to pull someone from the water, potentially saving their life? What's that like? Oh, man, it's so exciting. There's there's nothing like it. Uh, you know, you get to be a hero for a few moments, So, and you know you're out there helping someone who needs your help. You know, you can you save their life. There's... Nothing better than that. Well, you're definitely humble. All the respect to you. I know I'm going to have the chance to get rescued, but apparently there's some more training I have to do. So guess we're going to head to the pool. Oh, yeah. Let's see how well you float. Yeah, I'm looking for something different. A new feeling original. Yeah, I'm looking for something different. Yeah, I'm ready. So what you know? So in order to be cleared by the U.S. Coast Guard to participate in the search and rescue demo, I was required to demonstrate water proficiency. This involved gearing up with a flight suit and boots and then swimming several laps down and back in the pool. I then had to show I was able to tread water for an extended period of time, just to prove that should something go wrong, I would be able to keep myself afloat. All right, so I've only done a fraction of what the rescue swimmers have to do in their training, but I'm beat. I am seriously so tired. These boots, this flight suit, this harness really weighs you down. Not done yet though. Here we go. Now for the final portion of my training, I had to conquer what's known as the sweat chair, which stands for shallow water egress training. It's a device used to simulate what would happen if our helicopter went down over the water. After being strapped into my seat with a five point harness and quickly flipped upside down, I would then have to orient myself underwater, release my harness and egress to safety. So this may not look too intimidating, but if you've ever been strapped into a chair or a cage and then flipped upside down, it's definitely a little scary. Uh, but you gotta do it, because it's gonna keep me safe if it were to happen uh, in real life. No, I'm not gonna be able to find this. You could be on this. I blew out on this, but then I inhaled just a lung full of water. So I, like, I guess I didn't purge it enough, is that what that means? Yeah, you wanna give it a good work. Well, I got yeah, caught on one of the one straps. Strap. And I was like, oh, it's like God. Yeah. Okay, so reference point, and then it's just out to your final reference point. Well, Sam, you passed the duck syllabus, so now you're ready for our SAR demo. All right, I feel ready. I'm excited to watch you and the crew do what you do best, and uh, hopefully it goes smoothly. Well done. Now, as we get ready to start the search and rescue demo, I wanna take a second to thank Sikorsky, a Lockheed Martin company, for helping make this video possible. Not only are they behind the incredible design and manufacturing of the MH-60 Jayhawk helicopter that you guys now know all about, but Sikorsky's legacy actually extends back 100 years to when legendary aviation pioneer Igor Sikorsky first founded the company. Both Sikorsky and the US Coast Guard have worked together for 80 of those years. 
From the early days of their revolutionary flying boats to the record-setting speed of the X2 technology demonstrator, Sikorsky has spent decades developing and innovating new technology to produce industry-leading helicopters both today and for the next 100 years. So what is next for Sikorsky? While they're already working on some incredible upgrades to the H-60 platform, including breakthroughs in autonomy, modular open systems, and predictive maintenance that will allow this legendary helicopter to continue flying for years to come. They're also developing an all new generation of X-2 aircraft with the goal of bringing more speed, range, and maneuverability to outperform any other helicopter flying today. If you're interested in learning more about Sikorsky and the future of vertical lift, make sure to check out the link in the description below. And once again, a huge thanks to Sikorsky for making epic videos like this possible. So here's how this is gonna work. Right now I'm on a 47 foot Coast Guard boat that we're using to simulate a vessel in distress. Like I said earlier, every year Elizabeth City conducts roughly 300 search and rescue operations, and a majority of them are due to the rough seas and severe weather. So as soon as I make the Mayday call, that will alert the Coast Guard sector, who then dispatches Elizabeth City, and finally the MH60 crew for the search and rescue operations. Mayday, 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 47 foot vessel in distress, seven souls on board requesting immediate assistance. Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. Vessel in distress, this is a Coast Guard Jayhawk helicopter. We have received your distress call. We're in route, 10 minutes out. As the pilots made their way out over the ocean to my location, the flight mechanic and swimmer began gearing up for the rescue. The flight mech started by setting up the rope system, which is used to lower both the rescue swimmer and the basket down to the water below. For this first scenario, we're going to simulate an above boat hoist, which is used to extract a mariner in distress directly from the deck of their vessel. All for basket and rescue checklist complete, ready for one basket recovery of survivor. There's ready for pickup. All right, Roger with the target at two o'clock, begin the hoist. Roger, target the type basket's going out the door. Basket's outside the aircraft, basket's going down. Once the basket reaches the deck of the vessel, the rescue swimmer is then lowered down. That way, they can help load the individual in distress, ensuring they make it to safety first, before finally being hoisted back up to the helicopter themselves and completing the rescue. All right, we're now gonna simulate the man overboard scenario, which means it's time for me to ditch the boat, head into the ocean, and get rescued by the US Coast Guard. So the first thing I'll say is that being out in the open ocean is a pretty terrifying feeling. The rough waves, the cold water, and for the split second that I did look down into the dark murky sea below, I realized this was not a place I wanted to be stranded for long. Off in the distance, I noticed the helicopter circling back to make its way to my location, which even though in this scenario I was simulating someone in distress, it was an amazing feeling knowing the US Coast Guard was on its way to rescue me. Ready for a one free fall deployment of the rescue storm? Once the crew identified my location, they began the rescue hoist checklist, which involves lowering the helicopter to an altitude of about 15 feet off the water for the freefall deployment of the swimmer. All right, copy up. Out. Roger, position's good, easy down. Easy down. Out. Out. Easy down. Now from talking to the rescue swimmer earlier, I found out that this is one of the scariest parts of their job, because in rough waters, the size of the sea swells can change drastically, meaning the swimmer might think they're jumping out at 15 feet, but then in a split second, the swells change, and that 15 feet can quickly turn into something like 70 feet. Deploy swimmer. Roger, deploy swimmer. Swimmers in the water, clear up, easy back and left. Swimmers, Swimmers okay. Left. Swimmers out here, three o'clock. Easy back and left. Roger. 
Now at this point, I hope you can really get a sense for how rough the water was. I was getting pounded by waves and using every bit of energy I had to keep myself afloat. It just goes to show how impressive these rescue swimmers are, because they're the ones that not only have to jump from the helicopter into the water, but then locate the individual in distress, navigating their way through the waves to bring them back to safety. Once I was greeted by my rescue swimmer Nate, the next step was to signal to the helicopter that we were ready for extraction. As you can imagine, a downed pilot or mariner in distress could be in any number of different physical and mental conditions, so the technique the swimmers are trained on is what's called the cross-chest carry, which allows them to take control of the individual in need of rescue while still allowing them to breathe safely. Copy up. Roger, right five. Easy right, and hold. As we approached the MH60, things got a little interesting. First off, being directly under a helicopter hovering over the ocean was pretty intense, and we were getting absolutely blasted by all of the water. Meanwhile, the flight mechanic started lowering the rescue basket down to the ocean below, which meant it was now time for me to load up. Getting into that basket was quite a weird sensation. For starters, it was a bit smaller than I expected, and because of how strong the sea spray and waves were, I was doing a lot of this completely blind. But with the expert swimmer right next to me facilitating the entire thing, I was able to get secured in to start my hoist up to safety. All right, targets uh, at 12 o'clock, they're ready. Begin the hoist. Roger, and target in sight. Forward 30, forward 20, forward 10, and hold. Bring a vest to that cabin. Back on deck. All right, guys, so that's a taste of what it's like to be rescued by the United States Coast Guard. Let's just say that was one of the craziest things I've ever done. I was almost moved to tears literally when the rescue swimmer came down, brought me to safety aboard the helicopter here. Huge shout out to the entire Coast Guard search and rescue team. It's absolutely crazy. And to the over 40,000 personnel currently serving in the Coast Guard as active duty, reservists, civilians, and volunteers, thank you for all that you do. To everyone watching, thanks so much for tuning in. I hope you learned something new, and I'll catch you next time.